The Stalker twins, Whitaker and Adina, are now 20 months old, and their mother Shannon has high hopes for their future. I want my children to be geniuses in their own way. In England, three-year-old Edward Upson lives with his nine-month-old brother Justin. Their mother Mary Ama is also determined that her kids will get to the very top. I want my children to excel in life. It's every mother's ambition to have the creme de la creme. The key to their aspirations could lie here in Philadelphia at an institution which claims to create smart babies. Okay, we're going to do some multiplication. This is eight multiplied by twelve is equal to ninety-six. There's there's no limit as to how much you can input into that brain. It is one big sponge that is just waiting to be fully fully soaked. But recent scientific breakthroughs tell another story altogether. So, can you really make a baby smart? A newborn baby. In time, a complex mix of genetics and experience will give him a unique arrangement of skills and intelligence. Now he appears helpless and unaware of his surroundings. But inside his head, something extraordinary is happening. Billions of brain cells are reaching out to one another in a frenzy of electrical activity, forming neural networks at a rate which will never be matched in his later life. So imagine the possibilities if this explosive period of infant brain power could be manipulated to create a child of exceptional intelligence and ability. This is now being offered as a real possibility to aspiring parents, and not surprisingly, they're snapping it up. There's an immense hunger amongst parents and teachers at the moment for information which will help them help children's brains develop optimally to the to the best possible extent, and there are all people there are lots of people around offering all kinds of responses, all kinds of advice to that hunger. The last decade has seen massive advances in brain research. In their wake has come a multi-million-dollar industry in training aids, specialist toys, and self-help programs, promising that parents can increase their children's potential. Hi there, I'm Harrison, and I'm Sasha. And as you can probably tell from our graduation caps, we're baby geniuses. We are constantly bombarded by toys, by flashcards, by black and white mobiles,、um, by tapes that you should play to the child every time the child goes to sleep. It's like this is the type of mobile you have to have from the beginning. It has to be black and white and red. The contrast is good. And then we had some pictures also that supposedly show that the babies can't see certain type of curvature, so you have to make it the right type of curvature so that it's stimulated properly. We give Ariane a very stimulating environment with all sorts of different. Developmental toys, videos. As a new parent, I, I I sometimes fear that maybe I'm not doing enough. Maybe I'm not buying enough of those products. Parents have taken a huge interest in early brain development.、Uh, it's quite obvious if you look at the internet. There have been three key discoveries which have encouraged this intense interest in how to create smart babies. First. The massive growth in infancy of connections between the brain cells, known as synapses, they develop at a rapid rate, but a vast number wither and die in subsequent years. So the question arises: Could some of these early neural connections be saved before they perish? Second, the discovery of windows of opportunity for the development of certain skills, like seeing or talking, might there be a critical period for developing intelligence? And thirdly, the discovery that rats raised in an enriched environment actually grow bigger brains. Could this be true for young children? Together, these discoveries rekindled interest in what has become known as hot housing. For those interested in hot housing, the most famous place to go is the Better Baby Institute in Philadelphia. 
Here, parents come from all over the world to learn how to enhance their children's potential, physical, mental, and musical. And they start young. We have strawberry. This says pear, peach, apple, grapes. Tiny children can learn absolutely anything that you can present to them in an honest and factual way. Absolutely anything. Rainbows and rose. That's a dream glow rose. Pristine rose. I am persuaded that at the instant of birth, every child born has a greater potential intelligence than Leonardo da Vinci ever used. And remember, he's my favorite genius. Shannon Stalker lives with her husband, Kurt, and their 20-month-old twins, Whitaker and Adina, on Lummi Island in Washington State. She has a particular reason to be interested in Glenn Doman's approach. My mother, I believe in 1964, read an article. I think it was the Ladies Home Journal, and it told about this work that Mr. Doman was doing uh, as far as teaching very young children to read. He suggested this little book, which they sent me, and it's called Nose Is Not Toes. Always remember the start of the book for some reason, but and, uh, everyone knows that nose is not toes. I was a dominite, if you will, um, by the time I was by the time I was three. You've got what? Three. In London, England, Mariana Upson favors an early start too. For over a year, she has been teaching three-year-old Edward to read. C A T. R A T. Already, by some standards, Edward is reading at a level far ahead of most three-year-olds. But he doesn't always respond well to the pressure. Edward, isn't it? <laughs> and that one? What does that say? Why are you crying? <laughs> Glenn Doman set up the Better Babies Institute in 1977, but recent developments in brain science have made its message seem more relevant than ever. Many parents come here very hungry for the how-tos. Tell me how to teach my baby to read. Tell me how to teach him math. Tell me how to make him physically excellent. We spend much more time on the whys, on how the brain grows, why it grows the way it does. The brain grows explosively between birth and six. This is the magic time. So if there's one time you want to make sure that you're arranging the environment for stimulation, it's during this period. And Miriama is certainly convinced that the Doman approach can help her to improve her children's performance even further. She has booked herself into one of the Better Baby courses, and she is on her way to Philadelphia. Knowing me, I'd probably take the whole house with <laughs> me. And Miriama is not alone. Shannon, too, signed up for the course, although her twins were only nine months at the time. But she kept her plans to herself. I haven't told that many people about where I will be going and what, I've, what I'll be doing. A lot of people think, well, it's just going to be push, 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 or test, 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 or people say that they're too young, what are you doing? That's primarily one of the reasons why I just back off and let it be. I'm not going to change other people's minds. I think the end result will definitely change other people's minds. I think that my children are going to be far better off. And Shannon's faith appears to be justified. Those who favor hothousing point to the rapid growth in the early years of brain connections. These connections are called synapses. Synapses are really where the action is in the brain. They are the junctions 
between nerve cells. Nerve cells consist of two main parts, a cell body, and then a long, long process of fiber that goes off somewhere else in the brain. The contacts between nerve cells, between the fiber of one nerve cell and the body of the next nerve cell, where it transmits signals from the fiber to the cell, is called a synapse. Genetics are responsible for much of the early growth of synapses, but experience also plays a part. Advocates of hothousing believe parents can accelerate the number of synapses in their baby by giving them extra stimulation. I think early stimulation is very important. I think the more you expose a child to, the better and the more likely they are to be very open and very um, confident people, and hopefully it'll help with their intellect also. But just as some synapses are rapidly forming, others, probably those which are not being used, are dying. One of the apparent paradoxes in the way that the brain develops is that at first it seems to get more complicated and then to get less complicated again. That's judged by the number of synaptic contacts between nerve cells. They increase in number and then they decrease for a while. There's a phrase called use it or lose it, which means that if you don't develop the baby's synapses, then um, it's going to be gone. You can't then, at five years of age, take them for special tutoring or whatever and expect that they're going to catch up. It has to be done when they're young enough and they're um, able to absorb. <laughs> In Philadelphia, the Better Baby course is underway, and there's a busy schedule ahead. The first day of the course is called How to Multiply Your Baby's Intelligence. During this week, Miriamma and Shannon will also learn about brain science in order to understand the theory behind Glenn Doman's methods. How very nice to see you all. Now, uh, I think you may well find this week to be the most exciting week, from an intellectual standpoint, the most exciting week of your lives. Um, the thousands of parents who have preceded you in this room have found it to be. The course is intensive, 10 hours a day for six days. On Monday, it's how to teach your baby to read. On Tuesday, how to teach your baby a foreign language. Wednesday, how to give your baby encyclopedic knowledge. Thursday, how to make your baby physically superb. And Friday, how to teach your baby math. I'd like to begin by having the opportunity of introducing to you the director of all of the institutes. I should like you to meet uh, Janet Doman. It's the tradition to begin this course by going around the room and simply asking each of you to tell us um, who you are and why you're here. If everyone could just state very briefly, you don't have to give a long speech. Um, uh, you're not allowed to give a long speech. <laughs> I'm here because I have a beautiful three-month-old daughter, and um, I would just like to give her um, the best chance um, to be uh, bright and uh, special, special, more special than she is already. Hi, Shannon Stalker from Lummi Island, Washington, and. Um, I am a <laughs> oh my nose God. is not toes graduate um, 35 years ago. I'm here to teach my twin nine-month-old son and daughter. Great. The hundred participants have traveled from all over the world to learn the secrets of creating smart babies. They've each paid $1,000 for the privilege. I'm Vanessa Cintron from Puerto Rico. And I'm here because I have um, a daughter. She's uh, 20 months. My name is Mary Amateur Epson. I'm from London, England. And I have two children, Edward and Justin. The Better Baby Institute runs three courses for parents each year. But on the same campus, they also run a full-time school for children up to 10 years old. Let's make um, X equal to 3 this time. We're going to substitute 3 for X. So we have 2X plus 3Y equals 12. So we're going to it's algebra by the age X. of 4. So 2 times 3 plus 3Y equals 12. What's 2 times 3, Virginia? 2 times 3 is 6. Mm -hmm. So 6 plus 3Y equals 12. 1 fourth of 92 is 23. And it all begins with a unique teaching system. One half of 76 
is 38. Oh, he says. And one third of 51, whoops, I'm sorry, 51 is 17. One of the okay. amazing things that our kids taught us early on now, more than almost 30 years ago, was that tiny children can recognize quantity. Look, that's five multiplied by 20 is equal to 100. And as soon as we began to realize this, um, we began to think about what does that mean? And we realized that we had it kind of backwards in the area of math. You and I were taught the symbol, but we didn't really understand fully the, the quantity behind the symbol, which is to say you and I know the symbol 20, but we wouldn't know 20 dots if we fell over Did you look at this? 3 times 26 equals, does it equal 68 or 78? 78 it is. So, for example, if we show that to you and I, we will immediately say 27. But if you show this to the tiny child and uh, give him a choice, he correctly realizes this is not 27, it's 40. Because we're sucked in by the symbol. Whereas he is not, he sees the truth that there are actually 40 dots on this card. However enthusiastic the parents may be about the Doman approach, some realize that it's still controversial. I do find out that a lot of people do criticize the, the system, the program. Right. So why are you doing this? You're pushing your children, you know. Well, you have to decide what you want as a parent and what you're comfortable with as a parent and do what you're comfortable with. And that, you know, you're not asking them to do it. You're exactly. doing what you're comfortable exactly. with. So. Basically, you're not pushing your children, you're just encouraging them to right. do things. But I started doing the program with him, and like, what am I going to do? Send him to kindergarten when he knows at least two languages, knows how to do complicated mathematics, you know, so that he can learn the difference between red and blue. That's why it's so exciting. <laughs> so much fun. That's why you're there. <laughs> well, we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Oh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Even more questions. Burning questions. <laughs> Most of the course members have very young children. Several have yet to give birth which is good news to Glenn Doman. It's easier to teach a five-year-old than a six, a four, than a five, a three, than a four, a two, than a three, and a one, than a two. Uh, and beyond six, it, we learn with effort. Um, and what a shame. The school system is set up just the opposite. The, it starts when, when the war is over, and uh, in, in terms of the brain and the brain growth. Doman is not alone in his thinking. Much of the early learning literature insists that there are cutoff points in the development of the brain, after which its full potential for intelligence can never be realized. This is based on a well-known neuroscientific discovery, the existence of critical periods. What a critical period is, is it's a key period of time during development when a child has to be exposed to a certain skill to learn it. If the child's not exposed to that skill in that time, it's going to be difficult or impossible to, to recover that function. Vision, motor control, and language are among the functions most effectively acquired during these critical periods. It's day three on the Better Baby course. By now, people have begun to relax. It's time for a few confessions. Shannon's not the only one to have kept her trip a secret. I didn't even want to tell anyone at work. I just, this is uh, the weekend of my wife's and my anniversary, so that's oh, the anniversary, we're going to be away for a while, we're taking the week off. And that was it. Even though you're American and you tend to feel that this is a very American thing, I mean... I, I'm uh, very reluctant to talk about it uh, with people that I don't know. They have things uh -huh. like, you're taking the childhood away from the kid. Why would you want to do this kind of thing? So we're very reluctant to actually talk about it with people that we're not sure how they feel about it. I'm on vacation. I met a girlfriend's wedding mm -hmm. because it was just, it's easier. It's, it's easier. easier to tell yeah. them. A lot of this people think you're just yeah. bullying your children into doing something they don't really want to do. That's the kind but of what's one great bullying thing to do. Today brings a chance to meet some of the Doman success stories. Let me say a little something about the mothers and kids who you're going to meet. They are all members of our on-campus program. So just to give you a little background, these are all full-time mothers. That means they get up in the morning, they put a sign on the door that says, mother at work, do not interrupt. Um, they take the phone off the hook. They take this just as seriously as any uh, physician or lawyer or Indian chief. 
Um, I think it's very important indeed. They don't see themselves as their number one priority in life is making beds or changing diapers. They see their number one priority in life is teaching. Well, first we're going to ask Mason Zeberlein to come in. And Mason is 11 months old. He has an older brother, Winston. Mason's parents attended this course when Winston was an infant, and that was before Mason was born, so he's been lucky to be taught right from birth. Mason, come on down. Come on down, Mason. How are you doing? Come to the middle, and I'll let me introduce you. This is the May How to Multiply course, all the student participants. Yeah. yeah. Look, Mason, I have some new words for you. Here's some outdoor words. Sun porch, garden, driveway, sidewalk, mailbox, and the canal. <laughs> he said, I'll catch the words another time. I'm pretty- Yay, Mommy! Yay! Yeah. Mommy did pretty well, didn't she? Okay. Well, next we're going to have uh, Virginia come down. Virginia Peck Phillips. Will you be performing for us? Yeah. A little something? What would you what were you gonna do for us? We we are going to do some Shakespeare and a surprise. Oh. The first thing we're going to do is a Shakespeare game. Yeah. Mm. Okay. The game is to pick out an excerpt, and you don't have to read it. And then we're gonna to try to you're gonna tell me who said it, what play it is, and then classify it for for me as comedy, tragedy, or history, okay? That's a big challenge. Who says this? Mommy, um, uh, the three sisters. Three sisters. And what are they dressed as? What are they really? They are dressed as witches. All right. And what play is it? It is Macbeth. I just said it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and is that a comedy, tragedy, or history? Tragedy, because Macbeth killed somebody. Mariama has certainly been impressed. I would like my children to be like the children I saw today, because they're superb children. They're not just, they don't, they didn't really just excel academically. They were good in everything. Music is deemed essential to the Better Baby program, and Glenn Doman is not alone in this belief. There is now much research which suggests that classical music will benefit children's brains, in particular, Mozart. I'd heard about the Mozart effect and decided that I'd give it a try. Uh, having heard that some professor had done a test as to whether Mozart's music does actually do anything, and apparently it did. The first experiments were carried out in California. Students were asked to visualize a piece of paper folded like this and then like this, then with this shape cut out of it. They then had to use their special reasoning skills to work out which of the shapes the piece of paper would match were it to be unfolded. Students who had listened to Mozart's Piano Sonata in D for five minutes before doing the test were 30% more likely to get the answers right. Tanya feels Mozart's music has had a positive effect on her baby. She absolutely loves it. I've got quite a few of the different tapes. I think she's she's very intelligent for her age and, you know, the fact that she walked early and crawled early and did other things, you know. I just personally think that that, the Mozart CD, has had something to do with it. But what does Mozart's music actually do to the brain? We wanted to determine if there was a neurophysiological basis underpinning to this. Um, This led to experiments that we conducted to look at the areas in the brain which are differentially activated while listening to different types of music. The same brain was scanned from four angles as the volunteers listened to different kinds of music. 
The areas that light up denote the parts of the brain being stimulated by the music. A piano ragtime piece produces a modest effect. As does Beethoven's Feralese. But Mozart had a much more dramatic effect. In the Mozart, the cortex was lighting up in a global fashion. There were many different areas which were becoming active. But why Mozart? Here is this musical genius composing at a very early age. Presumably that he could not have learned everything at such an early age, that he is possibly then tapping into these innate structures that we are all born with, but he's tapping directly into those structures and transferring them, if you will, into music. The publication of the Mozart effect spawned a multi-million dollar industry in tapes, CDs, and videos, all promising to boost the brain. Every day people ask us how we got to be so smart. Music! Da-da-da-da! It's true. Certain types of classical music have been proven to help a baby's brain develop faster. It's a scientific fact. Music can make your baby smarter. <laughs> just look at us. Music is just one of the many types of stimulation parents are being encouraged to offer their children. The theory goes that a child's brain will benefit from a home filled with stimulating activity, a so-called enriched environment. One of the claims you see quite often in the brain and early childhood uh, literature is this claim that research has shown that environmental enrichment at an early age uh, would result in children having brains that are 25 percent larger or with 25 percent more synaptic connections than they would have otherwise. This claim comes from research on rats. Other people had shown that if rats were placed in complex stimulating uh, surroundings, certain parts of the brain would actually grow, would get bigger. We set out to determine what kinds of things were changing in, in the brain uh, in these environments, an environment in which clearly learning was taking place. One group of rats were housed each in individual cages. They were fed and watered regularly, but otherwise they received little stimulation. Another group lived together in a large cage full of toys and games. Greenow's team then meticulously counted the synapses in the rats' brains. What we find is that the animals from the complex environment have about 20 to 25 percent more synapses in the part of the brain uh, that's involved in vision. If we take the mountain of evidence from the neurophysiologists that prove over and over again that an enriched environment grows the brain, the brain literally grows by use. And we combine that with over 50 years of our experience that shows the exact same thing in human beings. We feel that not to act upon that mountain of evidence, for society to ignore that evidence and not to act on it is, would be criminal. It's a powerful argument, but is it right? Certainly, the three strands of neuroscientific research that underpin the hothousing argument are real enough. The rapid growth of synapses, the existence of critical periods, and the benefits of an enriched environment are now incontrovertible scientific fact. But on closer scrutiny, do these advances really justify the claims that the advocates of intensive early learning make for them? Brain science, in my view, is still really in its infancy, even as far as the researchers are concerned. It's a very, very rapidly moving field. We don't understand how the brain works. So clearly, at the practical level of its applications in everyday life, brain science is very easily misinterpreted and misapplied. The brain sounds very scientific, and people are willing to believe things that are based on the brain, where they're not willing to believe research and education. And so people go to the brain as justification for almost anything, because parents believe and, and some educators believe the brain tells you something and the brain doesn't tell us a lot. Is it possible that Glenn Doman and his team are actually wasting parents time and money? Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Love. You love Mozart. He began composing at the age of five. Five? 
He began composing at five. You know, this is uh, someone who's taking advantage of parental anxieties and parental fears, and uh, with no evidence that I can see he's been in business for, oh, I don't know, at least a quarter of a century. Do you think by now he would have some, if his program was so great, that he'd have some evidence that it did create all these geniuses? So where are they? Even after 25 years' work, Glenn Dillman was unable to name any geniuses created through his methods. And only one person has ever been allowed into the Institute to conduct research into their effectiveness. In the study that I did with my colleagues, we looked at those children who are generally considered the hothouse children. And what we found is that they didn't tend to have any advantage over the children who were not hothoused. We also found that, if anything, the young children who had been hothoused tend to be a little bit less positive about learning anything else. They weren't as enthusiastic. If your objective in life is to train performers like seals or like dogs in a circus, then that's what you do with your young children and they will learn the tricks. Children are brilliant. But what a waste of a childhood. Could it be that the pressure to create smart babies is all wrong. <laughs> On closer inspection, the three pillars of brain science used in support of hothousing, enriched environment, critical periods, and synapse growth may not be so significant in making smart babies. Firstly, enriched and stimulating environments, are they really only of benefit to younger children? We've known for years, based on research in rodents, that placing these animals in an enriched environment has an effect on the size of the brain and the number of synaptic connections. But we've also known that age of the animal doesn't really matter. Certain groups have both represented and misrepresented the work that we've done on complex environments. They often argue that it's only important for experience to occur within some limited period of the lifespan, say the first three years. I think that our research totally shows that to be wrong. What's important to note is that critical periods really apply primarily to what we call basic systems, uh, learning to see, learning to walk, learning to parse the sounds of, of, of language. They don't seem to apply to the kind of higher order processes, cognition, um, memory, the kinds of things that can happen at, at essentially any age. There are no critical periods that I know of for becoming Mozart or for learning how to do advanced calculus, or for learning to play chess. Critical periods only seem to apply to the basic functions necessary for survival, like seeing, walking, or talking. We cannot draw conclusions about learning culturally specific and culturally transmitted skills, like music, reading, uh, sports dancing. Uh, this seems to be a very different kind of learning indeed, and where, as far as we know, no critical periods apply. Since getting back from Philadelphia, Mariama has been hard at work. Beethoven, Tchaikovsky. Since the course, I'm very, very excited about it, especially what I saw with my own eyes. And all those mothers, they were so happy doing what they were doing. It's a classic example, and I think they're doing a wonderful job. If they can do it, why can't I do it? Husband James is a little more reserved. I can't say that I'm 100% convinced that it'll work, but then I haven't seen the results yet. What? You know this one. Mendelssohn. I'm not supposed to test you, really. But you know them, don't you? The question is, just how much of all this will Edward remember in later life? I have to say I'm very dubious about the value of the sort of trivial pursuit approach to knowledge that's adopted in some of these hot housing uh, techniques for training young babies. The rote learning of, uh, of facts, unconnected, not forming any kind of structural whole of knowledge. I suspect that those things will be forgotten very rapidly, and they don't fit into any general framework of intelligence that, um, that I think could be 
could be generally beneficial to the child. This was Ben Newell, age two, at the Better Baby Institute. Indonesian Air Force Mark 53, Spay Powered Buccaneer S Mark 2B, British Aerospace Sea Harrier. His mother, Carol, was convinced she was building an encyclopedic knowledge in her child. But was she? Strike Master Mark 88 and Strike Master Mark. We caught up with Ben 14 years later. I have no idea what this one is. Or that one. Or that one. Or that one. I, I can't. Diamond. Fluorite. Gold. The panic felt by many parents to stimulate children before they lose synapses is not based on scientific evidence. In fact, fewer synapses may indicate more intelligence. This cross-section shows the density of synapses in the average two-year-old, and this in a 12-year-old. By adulthood, the brain is a far more streamlined organ with far fewer synaptic connections. It seems to me I was able to learn many more things when I was 12 than when I was three. Uh, and one could well argue that it's only after this pruning occurs that you're really a general purpose learning machine where you can do a lot of these things. And so the three pillars of hothousing theory are under serious question. More synapses do not mean more intelligence. There are no critical periods for enhancing IQ and enriched environments enhance learning throughout life. What then does this mean for hothousing? The best thing that you could say about hothousing is that it's useless, that it doesn't actually do any harm, but you know, it keeps people busy and engaged and feeling like they're doing something. The worst you can say about it is that if parents are spending their time using flashcards or playing Mozart tapes or doing all these programs, they're not doing the things like playing peekaboo or round and round the garden or giving the baby a bunch of mixing bowls and pots and pans to play with, that are the things that the science has told us are really teaching babies just the things that babies really need to learn. Since Shannon came back from the Better Baby Institute, she has been focusing on reading and math. But it seems that the twins are more interested in other things. There was a very frustrating time when they were about, <laughs> about 14, 15 months where uh, they um, just were not, they were just so busy at the time. One of them was going this way, one of them was going this way. And I said, well, I guess it's not time to do those cards today. And, or not at this moment anyway. It's not all, you know, here's reading, here's math, here's this, here's that. Oh gosh, that must take maybe 15 minutes. Mariama, on the other hand, has been sticking to a more rigorous approach. And this one, what does it say? Daddy. And this one? What does it say? Boy. Yes, and this one? That's right. Well, I think it, so far it's working, but um, sometimes I have this, I have the impression it's all work and no play. Yes. But um, it, it can be difficult come, for me coming in the evenings and get to spend a couple of hours with the children anyway before they sleep, and I have to spend much of that time with them on the computer, taking them through names of composers and types of architecture, rather than tickling them, chasing them around the room. That's a bit of a disadvantage. Yeah, but sometimes when you see the results that is really working, then you want to continue. And then some days you say to help the whole thing, you know, I want to put it away in a corner somewhere. And who's this person? Edward? Who's this person? This is uh, John F. Kennedy, isn't it? John We're not doing it as intensely as we did on day one. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you can keep it up unless you have a lot of childcare support and housework support and so on. Mm -hmm. And Winston Churchill was the Prime, Prime Minister of Britain at United Kingdom um, during the Second War. And uh, <coughs> Mikhail Gorbachev, who? Soviet Union, leader of Soviet Union. Mao Zedong, 
how's it tun? Yes, and Lenin, this is Lenin. So how do they know that it works? I don't know if I can really answer that one. Um, I know that as long as we're having fun with it, I will, it's, it's something that, as long as I know that they're having fun and I enjoy doing it. And of course there are days when we're, when we're, when one of us is feeling under the weather or when one of us is, is, is not quite up to snuff and, and we won't, we won't do it that day. And many experts say that babies are learning a lot in other ways. Well, we think that babies learn in very much the same way that grown-up scientists learn. Uh, so that babies learn by doing the same sort of things that scientists do. They learn even by doing experiments. So the kinds of things that we see babies do that we think of as just play, picking things up and dropping them, uh, putting them in their mouths and exploring them, holding them and looking at them from every angle. You can think of all of those activities as really being a set of experiments that babies are performing to try and figure out the nature of the world around them. Oh, here he comes. Woo! There you go. Oh, look at that. So what of the wide range of products which promise to stimulate the brain? Have you wasted your money on the black and white mobile? Probably not. If you get some enjoyment out of it, you're, you're, it probably doesn't make a whole lot of difference to your child. Uh, but what has happened here, again, these popular interpretations of synapse growth and critical period and enrichment are kind of all knitted together. And it's very easy for someone marketing a product to say, well, you know, this period of rapid synapse growth is a critical period when enrichment has the most impact. Every time that I see a product that's out there that says that this is going to build a better brain, I already distrust the product. In fact, I go no further, and I certainly wouldn't buy it. We don't know how specific pieces coming in have anything to do with what goes on in the way the brain develops. What we do know is that in general, stimulating environments are good for people and they're good for brains, but we don't know how. And there's even more good news for those who come late to the party. Recent analysis of brain tissue at the Salk Institute in San Diego has shown, amazingly, that the brain continues to create new cells throughout life. There used to be this absolute dogma that after birth, no new nerve cells were ever made. I certainly believed it, and all of my colleagues believed it, but it's been discovered that, that cells are being created. This film shows a brain cell dividing to create two new cells, confirming the brain's ability to change, adapt, and regenerate throughout life. Surely further proof that early hot housing is unnecessary. All the studies that I know of suggest that uh, children who've started formal teaching late, let's say at the age of seven, catch up very rapidly with those who've started much earlier, let's say at the age of four. By the age of nine, uh, they're performing pretty much equally. So one has to say, first of all, what's the advantage of all that early training in the three R's? And secondly, even more worrying, what have they missed out on? My challenge is not to fill them up to the brim each day, but to leave them with that, oh gosh, mommy, I want more. But it's not all, like I said, math and reading. And, and we have our just going outside for a walk and, and, and our play. Beethoven. So, what can those parents who want smart kids rather than smart babies learn from the latest research? Parents shouldn't panic. Uh, parents have to realize that if they have a normal child, the kind of environment they provide around the home is exactly what the child needs uh, to develop normally. Uh, learning things is something we'll do throughout our lives. There's no need to cram flashcards, early reading instruction into the first three years of life. You'd do more harm than good.